Battle of the Atlantic was the longest campaign of the Second World War. It was principally waged by Germany's U-boats against Britain's maritime lifelines to North America and her empire. The U-boats' first sinking came on the 3rd of September 1939, the day that Britain and France declared war against Germany. The last was on the 7th of May 1945, one day before the official end of the war in Europe. But German surface warships also played their part, especially during the early years of the campaign. Indeed, the threat that they posed was at times greater than that of the U-boats. Two ships in particular were to be the cause of grave concern for the British. They were the mighty battleships Bismarck and Tirpitz. Hitler, soon after he came to power, had expressed his intention of building a powerful fleet strong enough to match the Royal Navy. His admirals, notably Erich Rader, the commander-in-chief, doubted the wisdom of this, believing that the German Navy should be tailored for attacks on British commerce, but eventually a compromise was reached. Even so, Plan Z, as the expansion program was called, was very ambitious in scope and was not expected to be completed until 1948. Included in the plan was the construction of no less than eight large and powerful battleships. Hitler presided over the launch of the first of these, Bismarck, on the 14th of February 1939. It was a proud moment for the men who had built her and for the German Navy as a whole. Two months later, a sister ship, Tirpitz, also went down the slipway and into the water for the first time. These two mighty warships were armed with no less than eight massive 380 mm guns, backed up by 12 150 mm and 16 105 mm guns. They were the pride of the new German Navy. But it was to be many months before they were completely fitted out and ready for sea. In the meantime, at the outbreak of war in September 1939, German warships were already at sea and poised to harass Allied shipping. One vessel, the pocket battleship Graf Spee, began to operate in the South Atlantic and Indian Ocean. She was soon leaving a trail of sunk vessels in her wake. As she continued to wreak havoc in the shipping lanes, no less than five Allied naval task forces were deployed to hunt her down. Eventually, Graf Spey was brought to bay and trapped in the Uruguay port of Montevideo. Her crew then scuttled her to prevent their ship from falling into enemy hands. By now, the battle cruisers Scharnhorst and Neisenau had also entered the fray. U-boats too were at sea. There were, however, too few of them at this stage to make a serious impression. Convoying also helped to keep them at bay. But in early April 1940, Hitler suddenly invaded Denmark and Norway. This brought the lull in the war on land, which had been in place since the overrunning of Poland the previous autumn, to an end. Then, in May, came the German attack on France and the Low Countries. Six weeks' fighting left Britain facing Hitler on her own. These two campaigns had resulted in a lull in the Battle of the Atlantic, 
but soon the tempo would quicken. This was especially since the Germans could now make use of the French Atlantic ports. By now, the battleship Bismarck was nearing operational status. She was formally commissioned on the 24th of August, 1940. She then sailed into the Baltic. Here she entered a period of intensive working up, designed to weld her 2,000-man crew so that they could operate the ship with maximum efficiency. The U-boats, now able to get into the Atlantic much more quickly thanks to moving their operational bases to the French coast, began a run of increasing success against Allied convoys. Part of the reason was a desperate shortage of escort vessels available to give merchant ships adequate protection. The first happy time, as the U-boat skippers called it, was to last until the late spring of 1941. But the German surface ships also played their part. During the winter of 1940-41, they were especially active. The Scharnhorst and Neisenau sent 115,000 tons of shipping to the bottom during February and March 1941, before slipping into the French port of Brest. German naval commander-in-chief, Grand Admiral Erich Reder, now hatched an ambitious plan, codenamed Exercise Rhine. Bismarck, accompanied by the cruiser Prince Eugen, would set out from Gdynia and make for the Atlantic. Simultaneously, Scharnhorst and Neisenau would set sail from Brest. The two groups would then meet up and set about ravaging the sea lanes. Admiral Gunther Lutyens, a very capable officer, was to command the force. He had already earned the Knight's Cross during the Norwegian campaign and would fly his flag in Bismarck. Unfortunately, RAF attacks on Brest damaged Neisenau, but Raider was determined that at least the northern prong of the operation should go ahead. Hitler went in person to address the crews of Bismarck and Prince Eugen at Gdynia and stressed the importance of what they were about to do. He was convinced that Exercise Rhine would have a decisive effect on the Battle of the Atlantic. On the 18th of May, 1941, Bismarck and Prince Eugen set sail. Two days later, a Swedish merchant vessel spotted the two warships and their attendant destroyers as they steamed up the Skagerrak on their way out of the Baltic. Within hours, the British Admiralty had been informed of this by the British naval attaché at Stockholm. On the 21st of May, the two German ships anchored in a fjord near the Norwegian port of Bergen so that Prince Eugen could top up with fuel. RAF photographic reconnaissance aircraft were sent out. One brought back photographs of the two ships at anchor. It looked as though they were definitely bound for the Atlantic. The Royal Navy already had cruisers covering the approaches from the North Sea into the Atlantic. Now, part of the British home fleet was ordered to set sail from its main base at Scarpa Flow in the Orkney Islands and make for the Denmark Strait. One of the main elements of this force was the newly commissioned battleship Prince of Wales with her 10 14-inch guns. The other was the battlecruiser HMS Hood. 
When she was launched in August 1918, she was, with her eight 15-inch guns and top speed of 32 knots, considered Britain's most formidable warship. Her flag-showing cruises around the world had confirmed her position as the pride of the Royal Navy. During the 22nd of May, further RAF photographic reconnaissance sorties were flown to establish whether the German ships had sailed, but fog frustrated them. But a Norwegian agent transmitted a radio message to London stating that three German destroyers had arrived at the port of Trondheim. The British Admiralty deduced that these had been escorting Bismarck and Prince Eugen, but that the two ships had now sailed, since the destroyer's services would not be required in the open waters of the Atlantic. Accordingly, the Commander-in-Chief of the British Home Fleet, Admiral Sir John Tovey, now decided to set sail himself at once. He did so that evening in his flagship, King George V, together with the battleship Repulse. Accompanying the battleships was the aircraft carrier Victorious with her swordfish torpedo aircraft. Meanwhile, Lutyens headed for the Denmark Strait, believing that the fog reported here would enable him to slip into the North Atlantic unobserved. However, two British cruisers, Suffolk and Norfolk, were positioned here and spotted Bismarck and Prince Eugen. They informed Hood and Prince of Wales. These two ships steamed through the night at best possible speed. Bismarck and Prince Eugen had now passed through the Denmark Strait and at 6 a.m. on the 23rd, the two British ships sighted them. They immediately opened fire. Mark and Prince Eugen replied, concentrating on the hood. Hood was hit by one of Prince Eugen's shells. Soon afterwards, Bismarck found the rage. One of her salvos struck the British ship and Hood literally exploded. But Bismarck herself had been hit and Lutyens decided to make for a French port in order to carry out repairs. That evening he detached Prince Eugen in an attempt to distract Prince of Wales and the two cruisers which were continuing to shadow Bismarck. They, however, were not taken in by this ploy. Prince Eugen, however, did eventually reach the French port of Brest on the 1st of June. In the meantime, Admiral Tovey, with his more powerful force of two battleships and the carrier Victorious, had been steaming westwards towards the Denmark Strait. That same evening of the 23rd of May, they began to close on the Bismarck, which continued to steam south. Victorious launched her swordfish aircraft, armed with torpedoes, one did hit the German ship, but caused no damage, and contact was lost in worsening visibility. But a radio transmission from Bismarck was picked up. This enabled her position to be pinpointed once more, and new bearings were sent to Admiral Tovey. But the Admiralty also feared that Bismarck might attack a vital troop convoy en route to the Middle East from Britain. Force H, built around the aircraft carrier Ark Royal and battle cruiser Renown, was therefore sent from Gibraltar to protect it. But deteriorating weather once more resulted in the Bismarck being lost to view. Catalina flying boats took off from their base in Northern Ireland to try to locate the German battleship.
Eventually, on the 26th of May, one Catalina managed to spot the Bismarck. The crew immediately sent back a message, giving her position. Ark Royal's swordfish took off to attack Bismarck. Unfortunately, in poor visibility, they attacked the cruiser Sheffield, which was shadowing the German ship. Luckily, their torpedoes did not hit. So, on landing, the swordfish were immediately rearmed and ordered to make another attack. They took off amid the gloom of oncoming night. They succeeded in finding Bismarck and pressed home their attacks with great determination. No less than three torpedoes hit the German ship, one damaging her starboard propellers and jamming her steering gear and rudders. By dawn, and with a gale now blowing, destroyers were harrying the crippled Bismarck. Her crew now pinned their hopes on German aircraft based in France coming to their assistance. But this was to be in vain. Approaching Bismarck from the northeast were the battleships Rodney and King George V and the cruiser Norfolk. The destroyers covered the west. The cruiser Dorsetshire was moving up to cover the east after being detached from escorting a convoy. Finally, Renown, Sheffield and Ark Royal were threatening her from the south. Bismarck was trapped. The first to close on the German battleship were King George V and Rodney, which had joined Tovey the previous evening. Bismarck sighted them at 8.30 that morning of the 27th of May. Fifteen minutes later, the two British battleships opened fire. Their target now plainly visible. Bismarck replied, but although she succeeded in straddling Rodney with repeated salvos, she could not achieve any hits. As more British ships joined in, so their superior weight of fire began to tell. Every salvo was now landing close to the German battleship, and shells were hitting her. Bismarck's fire began to slacken, and the British ships closed to four miles and then to three as they continued to fire salvo after salvo. Eventually, no more fire was coming from Bismarck, but her battle flag continued to fly. She had been struck first in both her forward turrets. Then her bridge had been hit. Finally, her rear turrets were knocked out. She had been reduced to a blazing wreck, and the cruiser Dorsetshire was sent in to finish her off with torpedoes. The cruiser fired two torpedoes, both of which struck the dying Bismarck. It was the coup de grace. the battleship capsized. She then turned turtle. She sank stern first, taking Admiral Lutyens and most of her crew with her. 
Indeed, only 115 of her crew of more than 2,000 survived. These were picked up by the British and brought back to Britain to spend the rest of the war as prisoners. The British ships which had taken part celebrated the sinking of the Bismarck as a great victory. Yet such was the threat she presented that the Royal Navy had to deploy its most powerful ships to bring her to bay. Bismarck's sister ship, Tirpitz, was to present a much more prolonged and more worrying threat. She was not commissioned until February 1941, but would never roam the Atlantic. Indeed, she would never fire her guns in anger at another ship. Instead, Tirpitz was deployed to the fjords of Norway. Her mission was to strike at the Allied convoys passing through the Arctic Ocean north of Norway. These were carrying vital weapons and war materials to Russia to help sustain her in her titanic struggle against Hitler. These convoys faced a continuous threat from U-boats and from German aircraft based in Norway. two weapons inflicted grievous losses on some of the convoys. But the greatest fear of the British was that the Tirpitz would come out of her lair and pounce on a convoy. It was hard to counter the threat, since Tirpitz and the other fjord-based ships were difficult to get near. Various methods were tried, including human torpedoes called chariots. These were towed across the North Sea, but unfortunately the tows broke and the operation had to be aborted. Next, midget submarines were used against Tirpitz. These caused some damage, but all the submarines were lost. The carrier task force was then deployed. Its aircraft again caused some damage to Tirpitz, but nothing that could not be repaired. Finally, in the autumn of 1944, the Royal Air Force launched no less than three attacks against the mighty German battleship. Its Lancaster bombers were armed with massive 12,000-pound bombs. Tirpitz survived the first two attacks. But the third, mounted on the 12th of November, proved to be one attack too many. Tirpitz was fatally struck and capsized, killing hundreds of her crew. So ended the pride of the German Navy. During their brief lives, Bismarck and Tirpitz presented a threat to their enemies rivaled by few other individual ships in history. Yet neither ship fulfilled the high hopes placed in them, and both met violent ends.